this is Studio B again, which also doubles as my bedroom. It's episode 12, and this is another Hoops and Dreams QPR podcast. As always, we'll be briefly covering the last few games before predicting the ones that are coming up, and then hopefully getting into some juicy topics to discuss. To help me with all of this, I warmly welcome back Zake, who is, doing, is joining us from Indiana State University. Yep. Uh, coming to the end of my time here, so definitely excited. And uh, what's the weather like there, Zay? Like... Starting to get a bit warmer. I imagine right now that the weather is pretty similar to to England. It's very gray outside. So, yeah, from what I've a... heard, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're we're making the most of any sunshine we can get at the moment. But I guess you're the same. <laughs> okay, let's let's go quickly through and uh, review the last three league games, which uh, actually make quite pleasant reading. Sunderland against QPR, as we all know, was a draw. Um, then we followed up that up with uh, two wins, one at Birmingham, sorry, one at home uh, to Birmingham and uh, one away at uh, Swansea uh, on Bank Holiday Monday. And we won that one, 1-0. One that was a nail-biting uh, finish, but we got there in the end. Those points translate into uh, seven out of a possible nine. Uh, and that puts us 16th in 46 points. We're well on the way to safety. So, Zig, how can I ask for you, can I ask you for your quick summary of the R's fortune in these three games? Oh, I thought it was I thought it was really great. the The Sunderland match, I felt we definitely could have won that game. Some of our finishing ability was obviously a bit subpar, but I was I was fine with the point considering this, the level of skill of their players. Uh, the Birmingham match was just unbelievable, great match to watch. Uh, my Friday was definitely, definitely great. And it made for a good weekend. And then today we, we looked amazing today. It was, I think one of our best performances, we really looked like a top tier team. We really did. And seven points from three matches. Imagine what we would have expected uh, <laughs> earlier in the season. We probably would have expected seven points before, before December, but uh, overall it was a really great, really great three games and we are on the road to safety it looks like yeah i agree i agree with you i mean the draw against sunderland like you i felt was two points lost uh rather than gaining a point um you just felt that that dominance was turned into a wasteland of opportunities in a way um by contrast the two easter matches show the r's back to chasing the ball player to gain game possession again and looking for goals having said that the match against Birmingham started as if QPR had a bad case of the Blues uh, when our defence stopped defending and allowed them to score. But the, the dominance and quality finally showed through, even if it was defenders Steve Cook and Jimmy Dunn who were scoring. Uh, away at Swansea today, as you quite rightly point out, against a side that's not now only three points above and with five more points, uh, it looked less ambitious after Birmingham, but this this was QPR, right? So we all were wondering what was going to happen. However, despite five changes, what we got was more of the same and yet another win courtesy of another defender goal. Dunn is like a born-again player. We have seen him at uh, right back making surging runs, slick one-time passes and also a devastating shot on goal. Um if the Irish Post starts a campaign for Jimmy Dunn to become like the Brazilians, known only as Jimmy, I would not be surprised in, in any way. Anyway, let's move on to uh, making predictions for the next four fixtures as we continue through uh, in, into the month. Uh, we've got uh, QPR against uh, Sheffield Wednesday. Uh, that comes up next. So you could have turned around and say that's another six-pointer, except we feel a bit smug now, I think. Um, Plymouth against QPR. Um, and Hull against QPR. So, Zeke, going through them each one by one, uh, QPR against Sheffield Wednesday, win, draw, or loss? Well, the way this team operates in its history, I think a win, a win is not a 100% option, but, you know, if he keeps a team similar to this, I feel like we have a good chance of winning, especially because they were, they were flying high, but, you know, they seem to be on the decline more recently. Uh, last couple of matches haven't looked amazing. But just the way this team operates, unfortunately, I see that as a draw. I feel like that's one of the matches 
where, like you said, we get a bit overconfident, a bit smug, and then, you know, we make a few mental errors, which seems to be the reason why we lose games or draw games we should win. Uh, so I see that one. I see that one as a one-one draw. Oh, good. Okay. Okay. How about Plymouth against QPR? Well, another one where we really should have won against Plymouth the first match. We got very lucky with that red card and couldn't get it in the back of the net. Obviously, the team at that stage was still learning the new style of play under Sifuentes. Yeah. Uh, but I see that one as a win. I see that as a comfortable, comfortable win. I feel like we broke them down in the first match other than scoring. Uh, but I feel like this time we're, we're more confident and their style of play fits how we operate. So I see that one as a pretty one-sided victory. Okay, that brings us round to Hull against QPR, which um, I would have said that they were, when I last looked, they were ninth uh, on 58 points, so they were looking pretty solid. Um, but their run of form of, re of recent days has been, sort of, I think they've done four draws and one loss. So, I don't know, maybe, maybe in our newfound confidence, who knows, but what do you reckon, win, draw, or loss? I think we can catch them out. I really do. I think that's one of those matches where the league table uh, doesn't tell the full story. And I feel like that's a match where we'll go in, see their league position. It seems like when we see other teams who are higher than us, we see their, their league position and we really get confident over that and really go in with the motivation of, you know, it doesn't matter where they are. We can beat this team. Obviously that happened against Leicester. Uh, I think that's a game we can win. I think we can repeat our performance against them the first time. And I see that one again as a win. That's wow. This is good. This is yours are different from mine. Okay. Um, I mean, I always looking forward to actually like a Sharabang uh, road trip with others up this from the South coast to the Sheffield Wednesday fixture. Um, but family commitments are put paid to that. Um, and then Plymouth uh, fell on our wedding anniversary, so that was scuppered as well. Uh, I don't know, whoever arranges these fixtures, could you please consult with me first? It would be a lot easier. Um, a decent side should win both of these, I keep thinking, except these teams are both fighting for survival too, and after all, it is QPR. Uh, okay, I'm going to stick my neck out, and I'm going to go for a win for both Plymouth and Sheffield Wednesday. But unlike you, I feel the away game at Hull may be just a bit too much. And so I'm settling for a loss on that one. So we're completely divergent in that respect. Uh, if I'm right, that would be an extra six points. And that surely beckons safety, I would have thought. Uh, with both. Wouldn't you? Oh, yeah. I feel like, you know, we're playing at such a high level now. And I think hearing from all the other episodes that I've listened to from these shows... <laughs> Uh, and the match preview episodes as well. We just need, I think, six or seven more points, and I think we'll be we'll be okay. Even now, I don't think that there's a level of urgency around us in terms of the league table. There was that stage where teams all around us were just picking up points like crazy. But I feel like right now we are hitting our stride and some other teams aren't. So yes. I think a few more good performances before we get into the very tough games, because, you know, I've said this to, to a lot of my friends, the Coventry match is actually on my graduation day. So I was really hoping that I wouldn't have to deal with that on that day, but it'd be nice if we secured safety and then I can just focus on, focus on getting out of here and focus on my family instead of, instead of focusing on the team as much, but you know, the way things are looking right now, we can really compete with any team. And uh, I, I'd say a couple more wins and a draw here or there. I, I think we're safe. Well, all I can ask the club to do then in that case is to make sure that uh, relegation is out of the question so that Jake's not looking inside his mortarboard and watching the game when everybody thinks he's concentrating so much on the graduation. <laughs> uh, let's move on to onto the more general discussion that we like to have. Um, I've got a theory that uh, honing all those quick passes uh, within those triangles, whilst it's an impressive way to retain possession, it's denigrated the ability of the wing backs uh, and wingers to move down the wing and service the strikers. I, I say that because it takes a lot of skill and practice to achieve this level of one touch, one -touch passing. Um, and I wonder whether the concentration required psychologically 
prevents players from switching quick enough to attack in the ball. Uh, sorry, attack him with the ball. Um, Zeg, what do you th what do you think? Could this be a mental thing? Well, I feel like as a team with the players, we do have the ability to play this type of football. And there have been moments where we play this sort of tiki-taka, one-touch all around where it really has worked. Uh, but obviously we have players on the wings, you know, Kenneth Powell, who great wing back. Mm -hmm. uh, he's one of those guys where he does have the ability to pull off moves like that. And I feel like under Marty, it's such a different style where you can tell he's trying to employ this, this style of play. And it's so much more different than it's been in other QPR sides. So it's new and it's foreign to us. And obviously, I think the formation with some of the players who have been here for a while, it's a bit different. But I think it's working right now. And obviously, it's a, a, a different type of play. But the 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 squad seems to be to be liking it and they seem to be using it obviously there have been moments where it doesn't work we get caught out and maybe some people are out of formation don't know where they want to go but i sort of have to say that i like it i think it's i think it's a good style of play it wasn't working before so you know now it is we have the players anderson in the midfield for example he's such a slick player and you really have to have players who are nimble, who know what they're doing with the ball. And I think we have the players to do that. And I think a lot of it also comes down to the signings we made. These players know how to play this sort of one-touch football. And obviously the players on the wings, maybe not as much, but I think we do have the players to stay in the midfield and not just swing it out wide all the time, good passing. And we've really seen it in, in recent games. So I think it's working. I think it's new, but I think it's been working to our advantage. Yeah, I, th I think the last few games uh, changed my my impression. Uh, to be honest, I, it crossed my mind after after I originally thought about this topic for discussion that it may also have something to do with the progression of the squad, which I think is in a way what you're saying. Uh, Marty has always stated that um, his preferred way of play is 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 to attack. Um, uh, and and to possess the ball, um, but first, in all fairness, he had to solve what was a really dire defending uh, issue that we had. Once that was done, he then had to improve the interplaying uh, between the the players. He seems to have achieved that now, um, and I think now the final part of the jigsaw is, is something that he's, he has discussed many times, which is getting that ball out to the wing, making the breaks or getting in between the um, the lines of defenders uh, and exploiting those those holes. Um, so that's the final bit of the jigsaw for him. Uh, and you know, hopefully we've got time now to actually see it, it fully as a fully um, completed task for him. Uh, anyway, here's a chance for, for all of you at home, I guess, to, to comment on this topic and, and sort of suggest uh, really what... Um, what uh, you think because we've got our own ideas that doesn't mean to say that we're right but it would be good for you to sort of come back and, uh, and perhaps make comments on youtube or, or, or on the hoops and dreams forum what do you think okay before i get any further into the next topic can i make it clear that i still regard gareth ainsworth as a club legend and i would agree with anyone who said that uh, he's a capable manager his time at, at wick and wanderers proved that um, that said, I must state here and now that I feel his coaching and managerial skills have been found lacking in the championship. Having got that small print out of the way, what I really want to question is, who was it at the club who believed that Neil Critchley's troubled reign would be improved by bringing in Gareth? They must have known that he would continue with the style of football that he was comfortable with and was successful with before. You know, why not? Um even though it was alien to the to the QPR squad, of course. And at the time when possession-based football was cascading down from you know from the Premier League into the championship, what rationale was there was there in playing like this, do you think, Zeke? I feel like in the history of this team, especially in from the 2010s on the last 15 years, there have been a lot of these types of decisions of just sticking plasters in, you know 
how can we make the fans like this team? How much money can we spend? Uh, and I, I still don't understand the rationale that they had when they picked Ainsworth to be the manager. Um, the team did not fit his style at all. And I've heard it from me- many fans on the forum and on these episodes where they say, you know, once we weren't relegated last season, that should have been it for him. He had saved us. He would have gone maybe back to a League One or League Two team with his head held high. Obviously, it wasn't great, but, you know, we were still in the league. We could have built upon it. But he must have done some great convincing to let himself stay in the position. And, I mean, there's a history of these types of decisions being made where it seems like someone will say, you know, what if we kept Ainsworth here? And everyone just sort of agrees with that person but it really could have been anyone on the board, any of the front office that said, you know, I like him as a person. He's a club legend. We should keep him around. But it was just such a such a subpar style that he brought and not one that can work in this division because the skill level is so much higher. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember after the Burnley match last year, he made a comment about, you know, possession doesn't win games. And everyone was so happy about that. And everyone lauded him as this great manager who knew what he was talking about. And I thought to myself, you know, we really shouldn't have deserved to win that game as much as I love the win, but his style just did not fit. And the thing was, he was so positive and he promised this, this bright future and it's going to work. Everyone's going to understand what I'm saying. And it just didn't fit the level. So I think he did some great convincing. And I think, you know, I don't want to say they were under his spell because he is a club legend and he did want nothing more than to see us succeed. But it just it just didn't fit. And I felt like Critchley didn't fit. And when Beal left, the club was just so shocked that I felt like they, they didn't know what to do. And it was How can we get the fans on their side? How can we get going in the right direction? Hey, let's bring in this club legend. And they didn't really look at, you know, I wonder how his style will fit into this division. And, you know, it's a decision that's been, it's this decision making that's been plaguing the club. And I feel like once Gareth left, they thought to themselves, you know, now it's time to really pick someone who we know can be tactically sound, even if nobody knows who he is. Even if people get angry at first, you know, he can make it work. So I feel like hopefully that stage of rash decisions and, you know, whatever their first opinion is the best opinion. I feel like that stage is now starting to be gone with this, with the new hire of Sofuentes, great signings. Now it seems to be going in a positive direction, but I think, I think we were really not prepared for, for Gareth to come in and we didn't really know what we were getting we thought we were getting a manager with really good tactics and, you know, obviously not. Yeah, I can't, I can't argue with that. We certainly didn't. Uh, when I was on the train going home from the Birmingham match, uh, someone raised the question of why we'd appointed Gareth. And they suggested it was a knee-jerk reaction uh, to, to Critchley's failings and the jeopardy that we were in. If, if that really is true then we have to question who it was at the club, you know, who was panicking, you know, as you're sort of implying. Was it the director of football? Was it the CEO? Was it the directors? Um, you know, if they were doing it for the uh, for the fans, I mean, I'd be quite surprised, but it, and maybe it was, I don't know. Maybe they were worried about uh, getting out of the car park safely afterwards, you know, the director's car park. Um, I just don't know. I mean, do you feel the club needs to examine this period perhaps and, and, and look at all their thoughts and actions uh, and admit that there was poor decision making based perhaps upon panic uh, and decide how they can apply lessons learned to take. Well, I don't even think they need to admit it. I think the results show that they <laughs> they made the, the wrong decision. And, you know, with Les Ferdinand, I was under the impression that, you know, these are two club legends, him and Gainsworth, Ainsworth, that know each other and maybe they talk a lot since, They have such a history at the club. And I think, you know, they thought to themselves, this is the next step. But like I said, I don't think they need to admit anything. I I think the recent years have shown that they did make the wrong decision. 
And I think just moving on, you know, I like how they have new people at the club now to make decisions. And I think that's a way of admitting that they were wrong. Just saying, you know, let's start over. Obviously what we weren't doing was right. You can see that. And let's bring in someone else, a whole new, whole new staff to show us the right way to go. Admit we were wrong. And, you know, now it's, it's showing now it's showing that the team has actually started to make the right decisions because they've sort of taken the foot off the gas, given the reins to somebody else to make these strong decisions that no more. So they don't need to admit anything. And I think right now the, the, the fans are starting to, to get more support, you know, seeing results going, going better. I think you're, I, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think results help of course. Um, but I, I, taking aside the, the director of football absence, I don't know quite what's going on there, whether they feel we don't need one anymore or whatever, but I'm really hoping that having Christian Nuri come in as the, uh, as the new CEO, uh, with his data-driven analytics uh, in a position of authority where he can uh, influence the selection of players, uh, you know, and perhaps even influence getting a director of football and, and God forbid, if need be, another manager uh, using data-driven analytics, perhaps. Um, that that would be a worthwhile thing for me, uh, without a doubt. Uh, so you're happy with how things are? I'm definitely, I'm definitely happy with, with the way things are going. You can see the confidence growing. You can see the fact that, you know, they're not, the guys aren't tentative on the ball anymore. They know what to do. They know who to give it to. I mean, after a a good example of that today was, you know, that cross that was sent in that, that Begovic didn't play very well and it went off the post. You know, in years past and even earlier in the season, when a moment like that happened, you could just see this team just Frozen. disintegrate and just lose confidence and say to themselves, oh, my God, a goal is coming now. It's going to go in. You know, we're panicking at this point. But you can see now that they said, OK, this was a mistake that Asmir made, but it didn't affect the rest of the team. Everyone kept working. And you can really see that the fans are getting back into it yeah. and – uh, good decisions are being made. Good players are coming in. Obviously, a lot of guys out of contract in the summer. Hopefully, we can sign them. I thought Sam Field signing was really great. Uh, and, and things are really starting to, to do well. He's really starting to get the team energy back. We're not just scoring goals. We're scoring good goals, which is something that I can't remember that happening. It seemed like once a month we would do that back in the day, but our goals are well worked. We're scoring on set pieces, which is unbelievable, defending them well. And he's really got everything working. And, you know, the new CEO, everything is just working. There seems to be good camaraderie. He'll pick different teams and they all know what to do. And, you know, I'm really satisfied with the way things are going. And I I don't know the way it is in the community out there, but uh, at least for me, I, I I'm very happy and satisfied with the way things are going right now. Yeah, I, to, let, let's let's put it in terms of bums on the seat. Uh, I, I think if you look at that, that stadium is full at Loftus Road every single match. That tells you that even when we were losing, things were bad and they, people were still turning up because they saw promise. And that promise is now, as you say, being delivered. I, I, yeah, I think we should all feel very, very happy about the way things are going. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of uh, episode 12. So can I... Quickly thank uh, my guest, Aig, for his contributions, which, as always, were much appreciated. Um, editor Dave, who was sadly one of the many fans who found uh, his trip to Swansea was cancelled by uh, the train company. And uh, all of you for watching. Do click on uh, subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube uh, and add comments below. You know, Let us know if you agree with the comments made by Zake and I or perhaps your ideas for improving QPR. Uh, I'm Brian Fisher, and this has been a Hoops and Dreams QPR podcast. Come on, you ours! We know who we are. You know who we are. We are QPR. I am